smart on those non-believers. Ah, uh, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. I am your boy with the blaze, Simon. This episode is brought to you by Lucy. Who is Lucy? Well, it's not a who, it's a company. Go to lucy.co and use the promo code BLAZE for 20% off your order. They make nicotine gum that's a cleaner alternative to smoking and doesn't taste like ass. That's not the talking points, but I'll tell you more about them in a bit. And let's jump into today's video. Five stories that are not from The Onion. Uh, <laughs> this is like, I, I was browsing Reddit and I saw there was a subreddit called Not The Onion, which has all these amazing stories that read like, you know, The Onion, where it's like fake, like, but not the bad fake news, but like comedy fake news where they make up ridiculous stories and there's a subreddit which has ridiculous stories that look like they could be on the onion but are not i was like danny this is genius some of these are gold please look at some of them follow some of them up write me a script and we'll do a video i'm sure uh, what happens here is uh danny writes me a script i shall uh, read the script and sam our video editor resident memeologist will write uh he won't write anything he well he might write some stuff on the screen usually that's slightly offensive to either me or the audience or what's going on or just people in general and uh yeah he'll just add some memes and that's 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 why am i saying this oh no anyway i'm sure the satirical comedy had it so much easier in the olden days back in the 1980s the uk's idea of satire was epitomized by the long-running comedy show spitting image which featured talking caricature puppets of the most high profile people of the day including margaret thatcher ronald reagan salman rushdie and of course Bill Collins. Mwah! There's something in the air tonight. <laughs> we laughed along as the show teased out the absurdities of contemporary politics while, pla while painting often grotesque pictures of Ronald Reagan as a befuddled war-hungry amnesiac or Margaret Thatcher as an evil cigar-smoking bully leading her government of idiot vegetables to victory. The show's popularity... I've never heard of this show. Uh, it's probably because I wasn't... Well, I was alive in the 1980s, but I was a baby. Uh, the po show's popularity dwindled in the 1990s when it lost most of its colourful lead characters. <laughs> Thatcher was replaced by the eternally grey John Major, while Reagan was succeeded by the cold and humorless George Bush Sr. Yeah, when I think of boring politicians, John Major definitely comes to mind. George Bush Sr. also. Spitting image became as bland as the political landscape it was attempting to mock, and it was axed in 1996. God, they'd do well today, wouldn't they? Here we got Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. Literally, you couldn't ask for better people to make caricatures of. Uh, 24 years later, Spitting Image has been revived for a new audience in 2020. <laughs> God, prescient! Big brain! Uh, but it now finds itself facing an entirely different pro problem. How do you satirize the current bunch of leading political characters when they are almost beyond satire? Well, Danny, you just go further. What's the point of trying to poke fun at Donald Trump or Boris Johnson where they're already when they're already writing their own comic sketches on your behalf? Oh, that is true, isn't it? Because you'd be like, no, 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 surely not. Surely not. Surely, no, it's true. We probably don't need spitting image today. You can't, you can just turn on the news and find your belly laughs right there. And The Onion has a very similar problem. Starting out life as a relatively obscure print newspaper, given away free in American university locations, The Onion went on to find a new lease of life, life online and has become a global comedy sensation, mimicking the styles and tones of American media while injecting a subversive comic twist. Yeah, even to this day, I'll get like YouTube videos recommended on my homepage, it's like uploaded nine years ago by The Onion. And it's in that, like, uh, not 16 by 9, but the old square format. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll watch that. And it's always good. Over the years, we've been treated to thousands of sizzling, satirical news headlines, including some of my favorite gems. Fun toy bands because of three stupid dead kids. Oh! Siblings quietly relieved older brother is setting bar so low. I'm under 18 button clicked for the first time in the history of the internet. Loved ones recall local man's cowardly battle with cancer. Jesus Christ, I don't remember the onion getting so dark. God answers prayers of paralyzed little boy. No, says <laughs> God, Jesus Christ. The onion's mimicry of genuine media is so masterfully convincing. The first time readers were often unaware that the content was meant to be a spoof news article, and they assumed that there really was some truth behind the intriguing headline, Starbucks to begin sinister phase two of operations. I remember one, and like there's great stories. Of, did we make one about a, a video about people, mis or maybe it wasn't on this channel, but people mistaking the onion for real things? And there was some senator who was up in arms about some state building and abortion plaques for like two billion. 
there was federal money going towards like a giant abortion plex and he was like, this is an outrage. And it's like, dude, it's not true. But more recently, the situation has been kind of flipped on its head. We now seem to be living in such a bewildering world of self-parodying politicians, bizarre global events, loony conspiracy theories, and the continuing success story of Justin Bieber. I was just talking about Justin Bieber in the last video I recorded and about how I tried listening to his music and it was so sh and I was just like, why? Why is this so popular? It's so bad. Uh, that it's getting harder than ever to separate fact from fiction. These days, it's not so much that we might get fooled by the onion into believing that a bogus story is real. It's the other way around. We're more likely to assume that the latest genuine headline from the mainstream media is so utterly preposterous that it might surely have been cooked up by the onion and we'd be dead wrong. The year is 2020, satire is dead, and here's why. Let's begin, that was a long introduction. Texas judge interrupts jury, says God, told him defendant is not guilty from the statesman in January 2019. What? This is it. Like, if that was the, if, if I'm that, like, I don't know who regulates judges to make sure they're not corrupt and shit, but I'll be like, we're looking into that guy. 100% looking into that guy because someone's paid that off, allegedly. The jury in the state district court in Comley County, Comal County, Texas, had just reached a verdict in the case of Gloria Romero Perez, who stood accused of trafficking her 16-year-old niece for sex and the purchase and sale of a child. Holy shit. I'll be like, okay, like someone's bought him off for a traffic ticket or something. Though you don't buy judges off. So this is super, like, because, I mean, you'd go to, like, not for, not for, like, small money. <laughs> no, I don't know if judges can be bought for big money. Surely if someone's like, yeah, I'll give you a billion dollars. I'd be like, all right, allegedly. <laughs> but that's a very serious offense. Like, when I think of piece of people, the child traffickers for sex. Like, gonna be right up there. There's, like, genocide, child sex trafficking. <laughs> Snipe, bro. Come on. Come on. Prison. Present. Noose. But then there was a knock on the door, which signaled the late arrival of a new member of the jury. Our Lord God Almighty! Word got to the nutty Judge Jack Robinson that the jury were on the brink of reaching a guilty verdict, but word had also got to the judge from the heavens above that God reckoned the accused was completely innocent. And he shot down upon me and he said that this woman is innocent. She should go free. Set her free. Break her chain. I was thinking like my next career could be like televangelist, American televangelist, because it just sounds better in an American. Like you could be your British beer line. The Lord God said that we should be free. We must be free of our chains. But if you just do it in a, like exaggerated American, like the Lord God said we must be free. Break free of our chains and ascend to the heavens above. Smart on those non-believers. Okay. Word had got back to the judge from the heavens above that God reckoned the accused was completely innocent. So Judge Robinson barged into the jury room to inform them that God had just whispered in his ear and told him that a guilty verdict would be a miscarriage of justice. ASMR business plays. Although we apologized immediately for his actions, he was quick to explain his reasoning. When God tells me I gotta do something, I gotta do it. And then to that, brother. Maybe God's next heavenly telegram to the judge will involve a segue and a very big cliff. Balmy Judge Robinson had previous form when it came to unorthodox behavior in the courtroom. He had already received a public warning several years earlier after sending an elderly grandfather to jail for the crime of calling the judge a fool. You suspect that the judge had probably sent a lot of people to jail over the years. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. You should not be a judge. What is going on? Despite the intervention of God in the case of Gloria Romero Perez, the jury dared to ignore the celestial advice and found the defendant guilty. Good for you. I know you're in Texas, so they're probably all mad religious. But at least they're like, yeah, we shouldn't listen to that crazy Allegedly. The judge excused himself from sentencing at the request of the prosecution. But although the defendant was originally sentenced to 25 years in prison, the case was later declared a mistrial after it was found that the judge had been making partial comments throughout the case. Gloria Ramirez Re Perez still awaits a retrial. Wait, I mean, it's not going to go better for the second time around. The judge is like, maybe she's innocent. Maybe God told me she's innocent. Second time around, the judge is going to be like, make your decision. She's going to be retried and it's going to be like, yeah, 50 years. I love it when some nasty criminal is like, yeah, 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 I want a new trial. My trial was a miscarriage of justice. And then they get more time. It's like, Mwah! As for Judge Robinson, he later claims that he had been suffering from bouts of delirium. And although he was given another public warning for his behavior, he's still providing the his distinctive Texas blend of delirious comedy jurisdiction today. Probably best to keep your head down in Texas. Yeah, no sh**. Uber's search for a female CEO has been narrowed down to three men. <laughs> Washington Post, June 2017. 2017 was a bit of a bumpy ride. Bit of a bump for ride hailing app Uber. Co-founder, CEO, and macho man, Travis Kalanick, 
appeared to be getting into the headlines for all of the wrong reasons. There was that time that he hitched a ride from his own platform, the posh end Uber Black service, naturally, and he ended up getting caught on a dash cam having a debate with the driver. Travis had been shimmying in the back seat between two women before the driver brought up the topic of how Uber's new policy of slashing fares was making it harder for drivers to scrape a living. Before leaving the car in a huff, Travis responded, some people don't like to take responsibility for their own shit. They blame everything in their life on somebody else. Okay, Travis. I mean, I get your point, but uh, not, not a good look, is it? <laughs> there were also reports of widespread gender discrimination in a toxic workplace plagued with corporate machismo, allegations that Travis had turned a blind eye to sexual harassment claims involving one of his new employees, along with laddish behavior outside of the workplace, which raised more than a few eyebrows. Poor Travis. He's like, I just wanted to be a lad. Why can't I be a lad? I don't know, Travis, because you're the CEO of a major corporation. Travis eventually stepped down as CEO after five major investors demanded his resignation. At this point, the company decided that what it really needed was a grown-up female CEO to bash some boys' heads together and help restore a bit of credibility to the organization. But things didn't quite go as planned when their long search for a new female CEO ended up with a shortlist of three men. What's going on? You're, um, Pawnee's Woman of the Year, it looks like. Well, it's about time. The problem here was that no qualified women in their right mind would have ever wanted the lousy job. Although Uber invested a lot of effort to try and tempt suitable female candidates away from their current high-power positions in the likes of YouTube, Facebook, General Motors, and EasyJet, the company's proposals were turned down every single time. It seems as if every candidate felt they were being offered little more than a poison chalice. Yeah, I don't know, like, you can, they can offer you God knows how much money. And I'd be like, yeah, millions of, obviously millions of dollars. Tens of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. And he'd be like, yeah, but it's going to sh** over the rest of my career if it doesn't work out. Because no one's going to want me after I was CEO of Uber and it was shit. Maybe you could do a good job, though. I don't know. I don't know. If the money was big enough, I'd be like, yeah, I'll take it. Part of the problem may have had something to do with the reasons why Uber was so determined to find a female CEO. Some considered the strategy to be little more than a PR exercise, which would prove that Uber can't be as sexist as everyone believes because they've gone and employed a girl as the boss. A bigger problem related to suspicions that this was just an example of the glass cliff phenomenon in motion. This is the situation in, in which women are far more likely to be offered key leadership roles during a crisis period when the chances of failure are sky high. The woman is being set up to absorb the criticism and blame before she gets fired and a clever man is later hired to sort out the mess when things are beginning to look a bit more hopeful. That is, that is dark. Well, we can't stand around all day congratulating me on receiving an award from some lousy women's organization. Back to work. Work, everyone. It's alleged that this has happened numerous times over the last decade, including cases with the female CEOs of General Motors, Yahoo, and Red, or maybe just women that be a, a bit sh being CEO. <laughs> Not really. Relax. The Uber job eventually went to Iranian American male Dara Khosrowshahi. The company seemed to blame this Uber U-turn, but a bum bum on the fact that there weren't enough qualified women in the world. That is not a good look. <laughs> That's the trouble with Uber. They don't like to take responsibility for their own. <laughs> They blame everything on somebody else. It's like, yeah, no, there's not a single woman who's qualified enough. It's like, no, Uber. There's not a single qualified woman who wants your fuck job, is there? <laughs> oh, and you know what you should absolutely get? Not a job at Uber. You should get today's sponsor, Lucy. What is Lucy? Who is Lucy? Well, it's a what, not a who. Lucy is a nicotine gun. Pfft. Anyway, Simon, nicotine gun. That is so 1994, Simon. <laughs> nicotine gun. Well, actually, one of, the, one of the smells in my childhood is nicotine gum. My dad smoked, like, when I was a kid. And this was at a time where it was like, and I remember it was totally okay, like, I'd, he'd be smoking around me. And my mum also smoked. And, like, not inside, they'd always smoke outside. But I'd go hang out with them, and they'd be smoking. And I remember, and, like, I, have, I, I enjoy the smell of tobacco. Like, tobacco, to me, is a good smell. Like, I know most people don't like it, unless, and I'm not a smoker, unless they smoke. But I'm like... It's a pretty good smell. I like that. Reminds me of my childhood. But anyway, where am I going with this? Yeah, my dad quit smoking using nicotine gum. Uh, and it was always this kind of really nasty smell. It wasn't very nice stuff. And you'd find like weird packets of it around the house, like with the used pieces shoved in there. <laughs> and it just smelled bad. And he was always like, no, it doesn't taste good. But at least I'm not smoking. <laughs> anyway, that was back in the day. That was the mid 90s. Lucy is on this mission today. This same mission continued for a new generation. They're wanting to decrease the harmful effects of smoking. That's good. So get your nicotine fix in a discreet way, pop in the gum, boom, nicotine cravings dealt with. Lucy was started by two Caltech scientists, which is basically like, yeah, 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 so we're smart scientists. We're not some dumb, dumb scientists from like the University of, I don't know, random obscure village somewhere. It's like a way of saying, I'm incredibly smart, without saying that you're incredibly smart. Basically, these two Caltech scientists, they were like, yo, this weird nicotine gum from the 
which is going to remain nameless, <laughs> but everyone knows the name, is that's weird. No one likes that anymore. It doesn't appeal to the new generation, so they reformulated it. It took them two years. Bloody hell, they weren't messing about, were they? They reformulated it. They came up with some flavors. Wintergreen, pomegranate, cinnamon. Lucy's mission is to decrease tobacco-related harm to zero. Dude, that is, I mean, good for you. That is ambitious. Like, because I, I don't smoke, like, cigarettes, but very occasionally, like, a couple of times a year, I'll smoke, like, a big old cigar. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure I get some harm from that, but I don't really think it's a problem. This isn't very good for the ad read, is it? But look, I mean, smoking gives you all sorts of horrible diseases, so stop it. Uh, look, we all know smoking is bad for you. Just said that. And Lucy has created a product that allows you to get that buzz without tobacco. Go to lucy.co and use the promo code BLAZE for 20% off your order today. That's lucy.co or L-U-C-Y, just in case you were wondering, uh, dot co, or click the link below and use BLAZE to get 20% off. Oh, I've got a warning. Warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. And let's get back to the video. Sign language interpreter used gibberish warned of bears and monsters during Hurricane Irma update. <laughs> what? Okay! Even viewers with perfect hearing may have noticed there was something not quite right with the sign language interpreter at a public conference held by Florida's Manatee County in 2018. Just ahead of Hurricane Irma, the conference had been called at short notice to provide viewers with crucial information about the threat level and potential evacuations. And to make sure that these vital messages were being heard loud and clear by the deaf community. Heard loud and clear. Okay, okay, I guess. I mean, interpreted loud and interpreted clearly might be more appropriate. A guy called Marshall Green was called in to provide the sign language. Marshall didn't look like your typical sign language interpreter. For starters, he was a white guy wearing a bright yellow t-shirt, which is a fundamental mistake for a qualified interpreter to make, as you're usually supposed to wear clothing that contrasts to your skin tone so that your hands are more visible on screen. I did not know that. There you go. He also spent a lot of time turning away from the auto cue to face the speaker. In fact, he seemed to be regularly turning away to look at everybody else on the stage in a state of mild bewilderment to what was going on please tell me they just picked a random guy and they were like come up here interpreter and he was like what i'm not okay okay and he just did it but the, uh, but the biggest giveaway for deaf ears was the actual words he was signing as manatee county conveyed serious warnings about the destructive winds that are about to ravage the state marshall green was signing absolute gibberish making constant references to pizzas and big bears and monsters some viewers complained that the incident put lives at risk and questioned why they couldn't just have used subtitles for the conference if the interpreter didn't have a clue what he was supposed to be doing. It turns out that Marshall Green was a county lifeguard who was not fluent in American Sign Language. <laughs> like, no sh but as the conference would be called at such short notice, the organizers are quickly called upon his services because they knew he had a deaf brother. <laughs> I had a feeling this was like one of those things that you put on a CV that is never going to be asked. Like, yeah, yeah, you could put like, yeah, you're an American Sign Language, you know, like other skills. So a good knowledge of Microsoft PowerPoint is like, I can figure that out. Working knowledge of Microsoft Access, which is like a database program. Yeah, I can figure that out. Although that's really, Microsoft Access is complicated. I remember having to learn that sh like, oh God. And then you could just put on the bottom like, yeah, American Sign Language. Don't know it. No one's ever going to ask. What they didn't know is that thanks to Marshall Green, his deaf brother was a pizza-addicted nervous wreck who'd spent his lifetime hiding under the table, trembling in fear at the ongoing march of bears and monsters. Oh, sh**. Woman tells TripAdvisor she was raped by a guide. TripAdvisor tells her to leave a bad review. <laughs> TripAdvisor, no! Uh, the TripAdvisor, you know that's not an Onion article, because I feel like they wouldn't use TripAdvisor, would they? Like, because that would be asking for legal trouble, allegedly. The TripAdvisor, this was in Newsweek, March 2019. The TripAdvisor website has been at the center of a number of recent scandals relating to sexual assault allegations targeted at travel companies that continue to be promoted on the site. And the response from the company hasn't always been five star. Well, to be fair, if they are just allegations and nothing's been proven, it would be quite own, I mean, especially if just one comes through, it would be quite onerous to TripAdvisor, for TripAdvisor to remove that business from TripAdvisor based just on allegations, because then you're... That makes sense, right? One notable case was first uncovered by The Guardian newspaper in 2019 involving a woman who only wished to ide be identified as Kay. She claims that she was raped by a tour guide from a business advertised on TripAdvisor, and the matter was reported to the police. Now, if they are advertising, though, that's a different thing, because then TripAdvisor are taking money from them, right? Is it a different thing? Maybe it's a different thing. It feels slightly different. Look, this is not 
the channel where we solve moral quandaries. This is business place. We make fun. But when Kay approached TripAdvisor, the company refused to remove the listing from the website. Instead, the best advice they could offer Kay was to leave a one-star review for the business containing details of the sexual assault. They also helpfully provided Kay with examples of other one-star reviews containing claims of sexual assault so Kay could use them as a handy template. What the f*** going on? Although, this is the police. Go to the police, Kay. Uh, and the Guardian, I guess. But mostly the police. Um, one of them was from an 18-year-old woman who claimed she was raped at a hotel resort in Jamaica. Although I guess like abroad, you're in some random country and it's like, I don't know, some countries in the Middle East, it's like, yeah, I was raped at the hotel. And they're like, well, you're going to prison for adultery, aren't you, woman? It's like, holy sh**, Middle East. What the f The hotel responded to her claim by launching a legal case to dispute the accusation, despite the fact that it was supported by a rape test at a local hospital. Dude. And this one-star review was buried among 5,000 other reviews at the hotel resort, which had managed to retain an overall rating of 4.5 out of 5 stars. It gets even worse. After Kay had submitted her own review, it was rejected by TripAdvisor on the grounds that it wasn't written in a first-person style. Kay was naturally keen to preserve her anonymity, but the website informed her that she needed to provide a first-person blow-by-blow account of the brutal attack if she wanted the review to be published. Of course, we can't expect TripAdvisor to act as a judge and jury in every allegation leveled against a company listed on the website. But they could possibly come up with a more practical and supportive policy than just advising rape victims to leave a one-star review which is destined to get lumped alongside other bad reviews about people complaining about burnt breakfast and dodgy air conditioning. Yes, TripAdvisor, we're not asking you to be a hero. We're not asking you to do any of this, but let's have a better and more sensitive policy. Should, you know, can we? Allegedly? Florida mayor arrested just weeks after taking over from Florida mayor who was arrested. Florida mayor is a Florida man. Uh, uh, the Tampa suburb of Port Richley didn't appear to have much luck with its choice of mayors in 2019. The serving mayor, Dale Mass, had an interesting medical pedigree. He was a doctor for many years before voluntarily surrendering his license in 1992 following the death of a three-year-old patient whom he had accidentally injected with a lethal dose of lidocaine. F***ing hell, dude. That's gonna weigh on you. But even after he was elected mayor of Port, apparently not that much, because he was like, I'm gonna be mayor! Uh, but, uh, allegedly. But even after he was elected as mayor of Port Richley, he couldn't seem to turn his back on the world of medicine, even if he was no longer qualified to do so. Uh-oh. Did he become a mob doctor? <laughs> You'd think he'd have his hands full with the madcap world of mayorality. But is that a word? <laughs> But that didn't stop him from inviting patients to make discreet, discreet evening visits to his waterfront home to receive treatments and procedures. Following an I, I mean, if you don't have a medical license, they can't take it away. Following an investigation by the Florida Department of Law, but they can send you to prison. Florida Department of Law Enforcement, a SWAT team turned up at his home to arrest the mayor for practicing without a license in February 2009. Why do you need a SWAT team, Americans? He's practicing medicine without a license. Just phone him up and be like, we need you to report to the police station. He's probably going to come. He's the mayor he's like yeah we need you to come down here and be arrested i think most people in that situation would be like okay yeah i guess i should probably what are you gonna do go on the run no you're not like most people are not gonna go on the run or if you're really concerned just send a uniformed officer to arrest him you don't need a SWAT team. Dale Massa had eventually agreed to go quietly but this was only after it opened a window and fired two rounds of bullets what i take it back should have sent the SWAT team this is florida this is Florida. Don't forget, this is Florida. I, there must be something that tipped him off, tipped them off to being like, this guy's probably going to get a gun out. Fired two rounds of bullets from a 45, 40 caliber pistol in the two rounds of bullets. So two two bullets from a 40 caliber pistol in the direction of the SWAT team, who by this point had his house surrounded, or maybe he was just chilling out at home and then he sees a bunch of men with guns around his house and he's like. He's like, oh my god, they're gonna find out about all the people I've got in the basement. <laughs> the SWAT team were on the verge of gassing him like a badger before Dale eventually surrendered. And you think that all of this might be considered unfitting behavior for a serving mayor? It's probably worth bearing in mind that Dale Mossad was probably, very likely, uh, off his tits on crack. Oh my. It was revealed that at his trial that during his time in office, Dale paid runners to supply him with crack cocaine and meth that he enjoyed on a nightly basis. It's quite possible that he had no idea he was opening fire on a SWAT team. He might just have assumed that a homeless drug dealer was trying to break into his property. The deputy mayor, Terence Hagen Rowe, soon found himself elevated to the position of acting mayor for Port Richley, a role which he happily fulfilled for 20 whole days before he was arrested. See, he probably got in on that crack, didn't he? Terence had been caught trying to help out his old buddy Dale, who was languishing in the jailhouse facing trial. Dale managed to get hold of a contraband mobile phone and used it to make a call to new mayor Terrence. The pair of mayors discussed potential ways to discredit the police officer who had been investigating Dale's case. Oh, this isn't going to end well for you boys. This is very, very corrupt. Allegedly. During the recorded conversation, Dale can be heard giving clear instructions to Terrence 
to do anything you can. Uh oh! Terence Rowe was found guilty of conspiring to obstruct justice and sentenced to two years of probation and community service. He was also ordered to undergo a mental health evaluation. Meanwhile, crackhead Dale Massad was found guilty of conspiring to commit obstruction of justice and using a two-way communication device to facilitate the commission of a crime. A defiant Massad claims that this is all fake news. That's a good one. Anytime you interrupt fake news, fake! Fake news. However, his sentencing has been heavily delayed, partly due to the impact that coronavirus concerns are having on local court systems, so he may have to wait a bit longer to learn his fate. They should have just flown in good old delirious Judge Jack Robertson from Texas. One quick call to his hotline to heaven, and all this shit would have been sorted out in no time. But a boom, boom, shh. This has been an episode of Business Blaze brought to you by Lucy. You can get a special discount. Link below. And thank you for watching. Or oh, if you'd like some merch, perch the merch.co, by the way. Why can't I be a lad? I don't know, Travis, because you're the CEO of a major corporation.